This is Show Versus Business, where pop culture meets pop money with your host, the real Theo Harvey, and Mr. Benja. So, Mr. Benja, what's been going on with you? What's been going on with me, man? Happy May the 4th be with you to all your friends, your family, your loved ones. You out there in Toledo, you out there in Mexico, you out there in Europe. Hey, man, even you out there in the dark web, uh, may the 4th be with you and don't do anything too illegal out there. Anyway, we got some good stuff going on, as always, Theo. As, of course, we're going to throw a little Star Wars stuff in there, being May the 4th. We only do this once a year. We got a little bit on Don't Say That. That's a new book by Anik Singal. He's been talking noise, and now he won't be talking noise because the FTC said, you're a guru and you're a liar, and we don't like you, so you're going to pay us money, and don't say that. Also, we're going to catch up on some music biz because there's a little heat going on out there. The Grams. If you don't know what that's about, it was this, it's the flames, dog. It's the flames. Kendrick's dropping flames. Drake's dropping flames. We talked a little bit about the beef last week, but now we got more to talk about because the heat's out there. Also, just some other little music news. We're just catching up. Flying a boss, T-Pain, kids paying money to go see a, a concert from a character that doesn't even exist. Crazy. It's crazy out there. Oh, yeah. And Bing is making money with AI. AI is being used to make comic books and it's spreading, man. So we don't, we still don't know what to do with this AI invasion. There's so much news we can pick from with AI. It just doesn't stop. And this is, this is a pretty interesting week, man. It's not like our normal standard kind of news, but we got some interesting things going on. So how does that all sound to you? Oh, man, it sounds wonderful, 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 Mr. Benja. So look, check this out. I like beef, man. I realize I like beef with my meals. So... This rap beef that we'll talk about later, man, I'm there for it, man. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just, I just like, I think the old, we're older generation. Let's just put it out there. We don't look old, but we are over older generation. And we just remember, man, and people that then play around back in our generation, they would call you out names. You had to go fight in the bathroom sometimes. There was a lot of stuff going on when we were growing up, Mr. Benjamin. So it wasn't, this new generation just got soft, man. From basketball players, LeBron to... Yeah, and I love LeBron, but let's be honest, he's not MJ. To the rap artists, they just, everybody's just soft and friendly and just being all, <laughs> they're going to go after each other. What do they do? They do sub tweets or around the fact. They don't never really go yeah. directly at you. I'm loving this direct action, man. This is like taking us back to the 90s, bruh. Just, I just don't like you. I hate you. Oh, just put it out there, man. So I'm Wait. just feeling, I'm feeling the directness yeah. and the love. You took me back to when, when a whole bunch of G unit people pulled up to the studio and while Ja Rule or somebody was on air. And it was just like, oh, wait, they can do that? <laughs> just exactly. like that. Tupac said, F you and F your whole MF crew. Yes, that's the kind of stuff I like to hear, man. So we'll, we'll probably get to that more. But I just want to just tell you that's my stance coming into this. It's just I just grew up on it. I just don't know no better. And when you see the, these younger generations starting to really embrace this directness, I said, because you really, there's no progress without truth. And so if you get to the truth and start really getting to the realness of what's really going on, then you can get some progress. And so I'm, a, I'm out of the mess comes new growth and new birth. Yes. So I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be new type of music coming out of this. That's just my 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 job my thoughts and with that being said i've been deep into the nba playoffs i'm no I, i'm the sports corner i'm the dad corner of the crew here so i can give you some insights from that side of things but man these nba playoffs have been fire man it's just just these guys are so skilled they're shooting three pointers from the half court line almost and it's like all a lot of games are very close and they shooting like three pointers in the last two seconds of a game last one second and it's just amazing to watch. And I have a young son who lets him play ball. He's eight years old. And I'm like, wow. So this is the next level where this is going, man. Do you see these kids trying to throw up threes, barely have the arm strength to get up a free throw, let alone a three-point yeah. shot. And so it's wow. I, I'm trying to teach him, look, that's the pros, man. <laughs> do what you do, yeah. man. It's so let's work on fundamentals. But it's just interesting to see this where sports is going in the elite athletes and what they can do yeah, yeah. and how you have a young son and, and try to train him in that pathway and wow he's got a little ways to go there's hope yeah, the, it's, it's funny the analysis and and study and information 
that we run into, it allows us to continually break that four minute mile barrier. Yep. Now, if you ever talk to people, they'll, they'll let you know that, Hey, human potential is high. And they'll bring up the example of the four minute mile, um, where they just assume that, yeah, you really can't get much faster than that until one guy did it. And they were like, wait, what? Somebody <laughs> ran faster and hold on now. And then they had to reconsider everything. So now with kids learning online from people in Russia, that's where all the, a lot of artists were coming from. That's why I mentioned that uh -huh. learning from people over here, learning from people over there, the iteration process is so much faster. And Bryant, our friend, Bryant B dot mentioned that he was like, yeah, I was working on something with my kid and we decided to record him. They recorded him, showed him, and the kid just had this back and forth process of, okay, I'm going to do something. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to do it again, to look at it. And it's, wow, there is no, your grandma, oh, that's good, baby. And you're not like, what does that even mean, grandma? It's oh, man, this gets so deep, Mr. Benja. So the higher level folks like LeBron James in his 21st year in the NBA, imagine that. He's 40 years old and he's still like a top 10 player in the NBA. That never happened when we were growing up, right? It's yeah. just, they, they, after 10 years, they watched. And, and that's because the information, nutrition, and just how to take care of your body and all that. And he's just the pinnacle of what that means. But to your point, even on a lower level, I do the same thing with my son. I tell him, hey, the way you shoot your jump shot, the follow through, make it look like a goose. I said, no, you shoot like this. He said, no, I didn't. Here's a tape, son. Yeah. <laughs> I got the tape, bro. <laughs> it's it's kind of like. This, this, you have so many tools that we didn't have access to. But with that being said, the margin of error is so much thinner, right? Because now you have to, if you're going to be to that next level, the sports or whatever, everybody has access to those tools now. So now yeah. what other things are you going to do? So now you're looking at nutrition, right? You're looking at strength, athleticism, little edges, little mentality, right? So mm -hmm. what edges can you get? Because everybody's going to have the same skill level. So what other edges can you bring to the table to get to that next level? And guess what, Mr. Benja, at this level, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Benja, this, it, they can really make some serious money a lot sooner with NIL, name, image, and likeness. Kids can be making hundreds of thousands of dollars in their teenage years, yeah. even before they even see a pro. And that's legal have. now. Yeah. And the fact that streaming services are putting more money into sports because they realize live sports is what's driving engagement and views. So they're going to put a ton of money into these sports franchises. So if you do get to elite level, the bare minimum you'll be making is going to be $20 million, Mr. Benja. And you may not. Matter of fact, there's a player today at Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, Tobias Harris. He's making $38 million a year. You know how many points he averaged in the playoff game? 12. Two. Oh. Two points. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Benja. Someone's paying you $38 million a year. You think you would average way more than two points to help your team win, which they did not, the Philadelphia 76ers in the playoff game against the New York Knicks. So, so I'm just, just saying. The first no. Oh. He, get, he just had to be the right place at the right time Okay, when the cap was there. And so they thought he could do something for the team, and they just overcorrected and paid him way too much. That's really business done wrong. And But I'm just saying they felt like the market said he had to get paid at that level, even though his skills were not commiserate to that. So what I'm saying is the high level is so much higher now from elite sports. And even at the lower level, you can make good money, even if a little flashy, but you may not make it to the elite level. So I say all I have to say is like this. And then the uh, opportunity has never been so much more open. And that's why you see dads like me and B dot. I hang over my kids and take them to all these practices and training because you're yeah. like, you may have a shot. <laughs> and why not? It's a good risk. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm all for I'm all for extracurricular activities. Oh man. But anyway, Mr. Bitch, that's been my life, man. What about you, man? What's been going on, man? I know you've been doing some interesting things on Sunday. What you said, I said, what are you doing on Sundays, Mr. You said something that I was like, damn, man, this guy. Man, why is he why is he get all the good lines, man, Mr. Benja? So break down what you, what you doing on Sundays, Mr. Benja. So in in just and this is something I, I've formalized this year. It's something I did here and there and played around with before, but I really formalized it this year. And that was to have my Sunday as my I don't want to call it my day of rest, but when I'm in my creative mode, what ended up happening is I would spend these periods of time where I would just get in a creative mode and say, okay. What's going on? What's that over there? Where am I going? 
what do I have to say about this? What am I learning? What am I expressing, et cetera? There was all these different angles to it. And I would just take time out, a little chunk of time just to focus in and come up with something. And I started doing that with my personal life where I was like, let me create my own life the way I want to. Fast forward. Right now, what I'm doing is basically on Sundays, changing the way I think. I've just decided to, I don't really do much social media at all on Sundays. I try not to have too many obligations. I do all my chores on, I stack them on Saturday and Sunday, Saturday and Monday. So I can just walk around the house in my socks on Sunday and look at all the notes that I've taken over the week. If I've taken some notes or whatever, oh yeah, that was a good idea. I should keep that one. Let me actually take this one out of the notebook and put it on my bulletin board right here and make it more apparent to me. Basically, I really just found that I can stop and change the way I think about things. I had a bad conversation with somebody on the phone. It's rum running through my head. I'm ruminating. I'm not reframing it properly. I'm like, you know what? I need to change the way I think about this whole situation. I just, because the way I'm thinking about it is bad. It's not fast enough or something. I realized my chess game was off at one point because I opened up my phone and played some relaxing online chess with some young clowns. Nerd. And <laughs> I'm just saying, it wasn't yeah. relaxing. <laughs> yeah. Nah, I love it. And I, I totally realized that, yeah, my there is a chess mind that I have. There's like a, a drawing mind. And if I go for my drawing mind and try to play chess, my chess game is bad. And I'm like, why is this happening? So, yeah, a lot of thinking about thinking. And it allowed me to move faster very quickly, just in terms of what I come up with, what I do, and the way I feel about things. Mm. Mm -mm. You know, human species is we just one of the few guest species on the planet that can think about our thinking. And that's so profound, right? I had come to a real re revelation about, I said, oh, you know what? I used to get mad. I was talking to my business partner about this. He was saying, this customer is this and that. It's like, let's look at it this way. And I realized, oh, I've changed my mind about customers. That's why I don't get mad anymore when they want to change their mind or don't want to have issues with paying us or want to yeah. get discount. And that has changed my whole attitude about it where I just don't get mad anymore. I don't even take it personal. This is business. But I used to get so mad. It was just, why don't you know all the stuff I do for you? What's wrong with you? Ah. But now I told him, so I don't even get mad about it anymore. And, yeah. and I think because I changed my mindset to be more empathetic to, to everybody and, and give them grace and put myself in their shoes. And then I was like, that makes sense how they are. And then it makes my wife, my kids, and then it makes me not as react as much. And to your point that came from deep analysis of who I am and why am I getting so upset and then reframing that. And so that's. I think you're right. That's the key to a happy life is like, because it's all, let's be honest, this is all reality is what we just perceive it. It's not really real. It's just what we perceive yeah. and our angles that we bring to it. So if you can shift your mindset, you almost change yourself in a new multiverse and a new yeah. reality that could put you on a better path. And, and the more you realize that, man, Mr. Bitcher, yeah, I think. And when you said you change your mind on Sunday, I was like, that's insightful. I think. A lot of folks could uh, take wind of that as you think through that. And one thing I did want to say too, I think also I'm starting to think not just about what I, I thought about in the past or what I feel perceived now, but also thinking about the future. So if I'm about to do something, the, the question I always ask myself is this, how does this serve me? <laughs> Sometimes I just want the distraction, fine. But then other times it's like, that doesn't serve me at this moment. Why do it then? <laughs> yeah. Is it serving my purposes to, to a this goal I'm trying to achieve. And then once you put in that framework, you realize a lot of the other stuff doesn't make sense. Oh Lord, they, someone's honking for Jesus, huh? Yeah, apparently some, <laughs> some, truck, some truck outside is just, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> He's in agreement, Mr. Bidges, so I love it. <laughs> Absolutely, man. It is just a quick point. Depending on who is defining what thinking is, we're the only species that does that. But that mm. kind of depends on who defines exactly what the bounds for thinking are because you start to get to certain animals that can recognize themselves in mirrors and it's like oh yeah that's me there's mm -hmm. like a there's different levels to it but a lot of people say that we're the only ones who can really retrospect 
introspectively look at ourselves outside of ourselves and in different periods of time, like you were saying with the future self. Oh, yeah, Christ, that's powerful. Yeah, you can reshape your path. We talked about this with Dr. Benjamin Hardy, who shout out will be here in Tampa in two weeks, about three weeks. I'll be there. I'll be in the number. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's all. I'll let you know what's it like meeting Dr. Benjamin Hardy. But yeah, yeah, just you can reshape, you know, what your past was and you can reshape what your future. And so the present has so much power. And so I'm seeing that more every day. Definitely. And if you're taking our words and really listening to them, don't assume anything we say is 100% truthful because you can get caught up in the matrix. Like our, our speaking of gurus, like Anik Singhal. I don't know if you heard about this one, Theo, but one of the B tier or maybe C tier even. No, I'll put him B tier. I'll give him B tier because he's been around. A B tier guru, Anik Singhal, who was, who had a, a process called Learn, not a process, a, a company called Learn, L-U-R-N. And he released some books and was doing a lot of promotions and the typical guru thing. Hey, you can make money by doing this and this. But he got caught up with the FTC. And the FTC actually put an article on their government website, which I, I usually don't see these getting sent around. So that's why it's funny. So this is from FTC.gov. FTC settlement su- suggests learn, didn't learn from penalty offense notice about money making claims. So I'm like, oh, dang, you got the government throwing out jokey t- titles like this. So, yeah, um, this dude said, this is crazy. Yeah. What were you about to say? What did he say exactly? His, his startup incubator program claimed that consumers could quote, make more than $13,700 per day. seems like a very exact number by using the exact steps that he used to generate millions of dollars online by just using an email and other people's products. So you've heard about that kind of thing where you just get other people's products, affiliates or drop shipping or maybe fulfillment, but somebody else's product. So basically start from nothing. And then all of a sudden you're making $13,700 per day. And he made it seem very obvious that this was a fact, not a, what do you call it? He wasn't just saying, he never did the disclaimer that, Hey, these results are not typical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. These gurus are under attack right now. Mr. Benjes. I talked about I'm on Dan Henry's uh, group and they were all, they're all running scared. They're like, Oh, what, what's going on? This compliance is becoming real. I told you I was part of a, what's the other guru out there? Ryan Pineda, right? He does real estate. They're the same way. A lot of other gurus have talked about that the FTC has targeted them. I think what we saw was just, a, there's a lot of gurus hit up before pandemic that were doing pretty well pandemic hit and they did extremely well. And because of YouTube and they were, I think a lot of these folks grew a lot of followings pretty quickly during the, during the uh, pandemic days, because that's where everybody was. And so they made so much money, but what's happening is we all know there's a backlash to everything. Uh, people are like, wait a minute, I paid all this money to this guy and I didn't get the results he told me and he promised it to me. And so now the FTC, to me, complaints, the FTC has got to do what they do finally. And so now these gurus are like, oh crap. <laughs> we made these promises and people to get the not look, I'll be honest with you. Look, you put, you pay, you put in what you get out of it, right? You pay what you work, what is worth, mm-hmm. but you got to put, you work into it, right? Now, look, this is their perception, their framework. Everybody's got a framework, right? You and I have frameworks yeah. that we go by. They work, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And then if they work for us, they may not necessarily work for the other person, but I guess these gurus weren't really looking at how to make more of the students more successful. Either they create a new offer that helps them make more of a yeah. success, or they try to filter more folks coming in to make sure they're going to likely have the success. And that was the problem. I think they just didn't really, they were making so much money. It's like, oh, just let everybody in and they're paying. Right. But then people are like, I'm not getting the results. And so I think that's what we were seeing a lot of backlash on it. And so now these gurus are scrambling. They don't want to sell what they call high ticket offers anymore, $20,000, $10,000. They're trying to sell you these continuity programs. But I can tell you as someone who has a kind of a a continuity program is just basically something that you pay monthly, like a software as a service. But the challenge with that is they they fail to remember that they're not good at fulfillment, a lot of them. So basically you have to provide value consistently or people will drop you like a bad habit. If you're not creating value consistently to make people want to pay every month, 
If they have to think about paying you every month, it's not going to last. So I've seen it even from Dan Henry's side. I've seen his has gone down a little bit, right? Because it's just not enough value there. So anyway, I say all to say is like these gurus are trying to figure out how to reshape what they offer it with this new internet age. And so I think a lot of them pivot to AI, but I still think it's almost still marketing fluff. It's not real, real. It's just more to get in the room, but uh, we'll see. The FTC is coming down on them. So that's going to yeah. prevent them from doing, growing as fast. There's a lot of moving parts here. So let me ask you this then. At what point do you call somebody a scammer? Good point. I know JT, the pocket watcher would say, but it's a scammer. <laughs> I don't know what I, it's, it's just, I don't know, man. It's just people. I don't know why I get it, man. You're a grown person, you know, that you should be able to do your research and figure this out. If you're paying someone that much money, I, I wouldn't pay anybody any money until you do thorough research and you've gotten some value from them initially. So I don't understand how these people are feeling scammed, but I don't know, Mr. Benjamin, what would you feel that would make people feel like some of the scammer? So. Now, the hard work thing and the actually applying the steps is clearly one thing that a lot of people, I think, miss out on. Like when someone says, hey, okay, you get into this program, do this and this, call these people, do this. And there's a lot of steps. And then someone complains, oh, these aren't the steps I liked, or this is just something goofy. It's not what I expected. And then they call it a scam. That's, you know, that's like... Or they thought they're going to make a million dollars and they made a hundred dollars. That's good. Right. You, you own a path, but you on may the not. Path, get to go. The yeah. But you may not get to the millions. And I think, and you know, maybe it's a fault of guru. They need to explain that better, and communicate that. Because yes. If yes. They don't. People are going to call FTC. <laughs> and everybody's watching their pockets right now. Let's be honest. We're in a recession. People yeah. are feeling the pitch. It's not like it was the heyday of Bitcoin, blah, 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 NFT. Then day, them days are gone, man. People are like watching pockets. Yeah, I so don't know. it's it's dangerous out there. But I tend to I I buy a, a low ticket pri priced thing, see what they're about, learn about them, yeah. and say, okay, this is what they're about. And then when they ask for the high ticket thing, I can guess, okay, I see where this might go or what you could have access to. Like even with Derek Grace's thing, right? Dude just smells scamalicious. He does. He does. I don't but know. How you do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's very clear and forthright. He's like, hey, look, this is what I'm offering you, this and this. And he even said, if you join up in this little group, we're going to have special guests. David Banner showed up one time. 19 Keys showed up. There was like, who's that? T.I. showed up one time. So it's, it was like, yeah, that's the value. You got a room full of people and they were able to talk to these stars they'd never have access to. So that was the value. And everybody was like, oh, okay. I wasn't scammed out of direct knowledge from these people or whatever. Yeah. That's, that happened. So, so in the, in the show notes or not the show notes, but the chat window here, I put you uh, another young on the come up guy, right? He's, he's got yeah. a smaller following, but I was just looking at his stuff and I was talking to my team about him. It's just, you can see, I'm not saying his name right now, but maybe we'll talk about offline, but you can see some of the younger ones that are trying to draw attention with numbers and dollar signs. And then you go to their funnel, their website, right? He's doing this thing called a value stack. He said, look, if you join my program, you're going to get this thing is worth $10,000. This thing is worth $18,000. This thing is worth $20,000. Yeah, yeah. But guess what? You only going to, you know, I'll have to pay $97. He is in that path of being scam malicious because yeah. that value stack, is this really something someone would pay $10,000 for? Or have you sold it for $10,000? So they're saying things like the value stack could be something that the FTC is really going after. But be honest, if you check out his YouTube, he's, he's knowledgeable. He's knowledgeable. A lot of it is like Hold kind of along the, along the lines of Myron <laughs> Golden, but he's knowledgeable. He has a little some knowledge, but it's along the lines of Myron Golden. I, I could tell. He's probably getting coached by Myron. <laughs> Bruh. Yeah. But uh, this is low budget. And if you're going to be low budget. Okay. As I said, and I'll go back to Derek Grace was looking low budget on a lot of his stuff. But then you saw him walk into a store that he owned. And everybody was like, hey, Derek, da -da -da. yeah, I own the store. And da -da, me and my pops. And he's like, okay. He brings in the actual proof. 
his father worked in the government of secret service. So he has the ability to run a gun store and all this. He's like, yeah, this, this is in the family. So don't worry about my low ticket, low production rate YouTube videos. So he's like, yeah, I got you. So, okay. But this guy, like, if I don't know you, what are you coming with? Is his shirt even ironed out? That's, that's the hard part, man. Just the social proof, proving your bona fides. He's trying to do it with numbers. It's a lot, man. Just trying to what the know and trust, right? Get through that, that process as fast as possible. So you asked a good question. I don't know where that line is, but I think people just need to be genuine. And, and I think Myra said best, man, just try to figure out how you can help people. If you make yeah. that your focus, you know, yes, the money will come, but you just got to really make that like top line. Cause if you don't, you will fall into that scam malicious. Cause just, man, I just want to make the money and you got to, it's a balancing act. You want to make the money, but you also got to figure out how to help the people more. Cause if you focus on that, yeah. then guess what? They won't feel like you're trying to scam them. You know who, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. You know who scams a lot in my uh -oh. opinion? trainers. <laughs> yes. They just, I, I went to the gym and I saw some fitness trainer in there. Hey, you just do this for three more hours and come back next week. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> This is what you're, this is what you're telling people to do. I was like, all right, all right, whatever. Anyway, enough on that. Talk, talking about scams too much just gets my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's just jump to some general news really quick. It's May the 4th, man. Phantom Menace. Are you going to see it in the theaters? No. no. Are you? But look, look, it's 25th anniversary of when it came out. Wow. Can you believe that, Mr. Benchick? It's crazy. Oh, I remember, did we go together? I, did we go no. at the same? I, we didn't? Okay. I, it was in May, so probably we're out of school. So probably saw it separately. I think I was probably here in Tampa when I saw it. I can't remember. But we were so hype about that movie, Mr. Benjamin. We saw the first trailer. I got so geeked. Because let's be honest, in a world now where there's Star Wars cartoons and TV shows coming out, yeah. that was the first bit of like Star Wars video that we've seen in almost 25, 30 years. We saw when we were little kids, Star yeah, Wars original yeah. trilogy. But we, I remember Mr. Benjamin, me and you geeked out for that. Like how long? That Oof. was like a fun day. Dude, the, when you saw like the Gungan walking through the smoke in the trailer, you just, yes. just burned in my memory like that. I'm like, wow, oh, that's crazy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I remember, remember they had the original trilogy come back out to the theaters to get you hype. 99. Yeah. They would get yeah. you hype. And you just like, we would, I th we did go see that together. I do remember we saw one of them together, I think, mm -hmm. but yeah, man. So 25 years later, the Phantom Menace comes out. Does it still hold up? What is obviously the time we were hyped, but someone made a good point. I listened to a podcast, the Midnight Boys, shout out to Van Latham and the crew over there. They had said the reason why we thought it was good is because it ended so good with the duel of fates, right? Yeah. <laughs> Dolph, Dolph Maul, but then Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan lightsaber yeah. battle. But then in reflection, I think we, I said, I'll, I'll leave it to your opinion. I know you have an interesting take. I thought it was, I just thought oh, that was not good. <laughs> a light of day. It was like, I hate to use this analogy. You meet a girl, whatever, you hang out. Something was great. Then you wake up and say, oh no. That, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> I thought it was great, man. I thought it was great. I still do. And for whatever reason, man, I, I stand with the Phantom Menace. <laughs> Is it the sound, Mr. Benjamin? That's what it was, right? The, hey, the I did. Sound. I did buy a surround sound system. I can't remember if I bought it for the Phantom Menace DVD release or not, but I think I might have done those at the same time just because it felt like a good idea. And yeah, my, I pissed my neighbors off for that entire week, I think. Oh, man, you were so hyped, man. When you heard the, the sound, look at this, look at the sound. Turn this up. You hear that kiss? I was like, I don't pop can. Pod race and Dolby surround. Oh, my God. God. All right. I can't talk about that too much either. What's it called? The mil oh, man, I can't even say it right now. The, uh, when they introduced the, uh, what's the number amount of force sensitive sensitivity. What was that? Starts of an M. The oh, Koreans? Or, Koreans? Yeah. That's what I was listening to. And I was like, what? Uh, what? Korean? <laughs> that was badly explained. <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> hey, 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 see, no, this is what he, Mr. Benjamin, he would like this. 
Oh, you, you, you. Oh, it's off the charts. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're using science to explain myth. Myth as it like it was. It was badly explained, and <laughs> the, the, the little Gillette razor that they wrapped in a in some high tech looking equipment didn't go over well in terms of and discussion was yeah. bad. Yes, but. I it makes definitely. sense. And if you'd like to flame me in the comments, we can discuss it further. Midi Quiridians <laughs> makes sense. Sorry. Oh, man. And then Jar Banks, rest in peace. No, he's, I think he's still right. He showed up in, whatchamacallit, the actor that played them. Ahmad Best, yeah. I think that's his name. Yeah, Ahmad Best. But, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, Jar Banks, I was, it was cringe. It was cringe. Still cringe. Still. Yes, Amisa Massa, Massa, Amisa Massa. Oh, still, oh, still no. cringe. Um, oh, calm no. down, Jamaican uh, accent. <laughs> it, it was weird. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. George yeah. Lucas. I think that's when his book pick came in that morning. After, after it was released, he was like, George, wrap this trilogy up, and you may want to sell. <laughs> <laughs> sell high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so but, kudos to them. It, it was funny. I came up. It's funny because there are cringe things that bother you and cringe things that don't. And yeah, there was one of the cringe things that hit me and you obviously. It's funny. I start, I talked to other people and I thought about this. And I was like, Hey, what did you think about the, the Viceroy and his accent and his people? And they were like, Oh, oh you, you mean that effed up Asian accent? Of, oh, yeah. 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 So yeah. there was, there was just a lot of bits of cringe in there that hit a lot of people. But there's some people, people upset about young Anakin saying, we, yippee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was kind of crazy, but I laugh at it too. Because Darth Vader was right behind yeah. me over here. The greatest villain in cinema. Say, yippee. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you put it like that. He was, man. The greatest villain they ever created in cinema, man. Who's, who's even bigger than Darth Vader? Yippee. That's funny. <laughs> I forgot there's, yeah. a, there's a term for that in, in like creative circles where you don't want certain things to be associated with the character because it messes up their vibe. And yeah, EP vibe. does not, did not vibe with Darth Vader. Well, yeah. No. Yeah. All right. Let's jump back over to the, the music thing. You were talking about this beef that's got you hyped up. Man, Kendrick Lamar just dropped this. How, how long ago was this? A day ago? It was just yesterday, I think. It was, just, it was this morning. It was like late last night, Mr. Benja. Look, man, I'm not the resident music guy here on this pod, but I would just say that Kendrick, man, he's just on another level, man. So obviously he dropped Euphoria. Now I, I got hyped about that. So I think I came in when I heard this bubbling and then I finally went deep dive on the little beat, little subreddits and all that stuff they were talking about between him and Drake. And obviously we all heard about Jake going after Rick Ross and then he got future in the mix and then J Cole. And so J Cole bowed Chris out. Brown. Yeah. Chris Brown was in there. So it's just, it just was just, just pile on. It's just like, and I'm there for it, man. Like I was telling you before, man, this is, this is how it should be, man. It's just been too sanitized, man, for too long. Let's just get in there, man. Let's do it. And then you got what Kanye sent his tweets out there <laughs> that you sent me, remember? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not safe for work, guys, but maybe we'll put it somewhere on YouTube. Just see the link to it, but hilarious. Anyway. Yeah. So it's just everybody just taking their shots, man. Then obviously Drake is feeling, you know, beat up on. So he releases push ups and goes directly at Kendrick hard. And everybody's like, oh, that's awesome. That's great. And so obviously, what's his name had to get into it? Rick Ross. So he, he dropped the line BBL Drizzy. And so there was a whole music. So th that's the funny part with this beef is like, it's made for the AI and social media age. So people can create content faster and post it faster than they ever had with any other previous beefs, right? The Nas and Jay Z beefs. But now you got like third parties coming in to keep the flames going, right? Hot. So anyway, you had, yes, the flames are going hot. So he dropped that push-ups. Kendrick didn't say nothing for a long time. Then he dropped Euphoria and it just blew the internet up. He just went after Drake about his character and how he raises his son and just the fact that because he's basically half white, he shouldn't say the N-word anymore. <laughs> and so it just went off, man. So everybody was talking about that. 
So obviously it was quiet. It was what they call almost a ceasefire for a little bit, but it was flamed. It was flaming up. I think yesterday Drake finally did his, Drake finally released his out, his latest one to go back at him. And it was called Family Matters and basically just went off on. And, and so this one, it gets nasty a little bit. Now they start calling each other's families out. And, and they're like direct responses. Yeah. So you know it's a disrespect because there's direct response to the last one. So he yeah. said, yeah, you think I'm black? I'm not black enough, but I did this. You talk about my family, but you beat your wife. So that's what Drake's whole thing was. And then Kendrick released his like immediately. So it was almost like a chess move. He knew. Drake was going to go hard on the family piece. So he already has something he called meet the grams, which basically just basically he was addressing it to every member of Drake's family, those known and those unknown where they mentioned that he may even have a secret mm -hmm. daughter out there. <laughs> it was just, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know if you heard it, Mr. Benjamin, but it's just well, like, he goes so hard, Kendrick. Well, That's what's funny, what he does. what's funny is there are certain lines that you don't like to cross in that the a lot of people in rap and hip hop don't like to cross. And one of them is family and especially the kids and the wife. You just leave them out of it. Yeah. But what happens is, and Drake, I got to say, he's not from that rap cloth that follows those rules. So once he started stepping outside those lines and you put some subliminals out there, then that's when you have people like Pusha T coming out the woodwork like, oh, you don't know how we actually get down, do you? Yeah. And then start dropping some fire. And all of a sudden, this guy is, why are you scorching me? And it's dumb. What you talking about? Why are you scorching you? Came in here, left a hot plate on the couch and did all this kind of stuff. And you didn't want fire to happen? Quit playing. So yeah. I, think, yeah, I, I think he's getting what he right. deserves almost. Yeah. Habitually lying, Stefan. I just... Kendrick says it in Meet the Grams. He said, look, we're not, I just try to play it the, the normal rules, but you want to talk about families? So let's do it. And it was like, damn. Here's some of the lines Drake said in Family Matters. Is it self-defense when you put your hands on your girl because she's bigger than you? So it's, you know, <laughs> he's going after the rumors of, you know, doing all that. And he had a few hits there and everything. And just, but. A few hits. But when, yeah, a few hits on K Dot, if you will. But then he went off. And like he said, he went through each one of his family members from his his mom to his dad. He said, Dennis, you raised a horrible person. <laughs> to his son, Adonis, that you may not even know, but I'll be your mentor. <laughs> <laughs> then he went to the Kendrick Lamar. Oh, man, it's too much. The Kendrick Lamar went to his quote unquote secret daughter that no one's supposed to know about. He said, you should be teaching your, her timetables and watching Frozen with you. <laughs> just, just going into like his character. And then when he ended it, then he hinted at he's into messing with little girls and all this other mess. And he said, he said, basically bump a rap battle. You in a lifelong battle with yourself. I was like, damn. So it was like, he was just trying to, and, and I think that's going to change Drake's legacy. Now he has some hits. People love them. He's not of the streets. Of, he's not of the streets of the rap battle. He went after the wrong one, even though in 10 years from now, we're going to just say, Drake, he was a pop artist, not a rapper. He, this is in, within an episode of him doubling down. So he knew the risk. So yeah. But did this, but he just like anything, he went, he doubled down. He said, this is what I do. I rap battle. I like to rap. I study it. I want to. Get into it. This was his thing when he first came out. That's what he did all the time, which is rap battle to prove his bona fides. And so I think that's just a part of who he believes he is. It's when you get into that family thing, it's just like, it's nasty. It's, it's I, like I said, it, it's starting to get a little nasty. So we'll see what Drake does. If he's going to calm it down like J. Cole did. J. Cole's like, oh my God, let's just all get along. Even though, let's be honest, J. Cole back in the day was like, I'm ready in the MC to come after me. Let's do this. And now all of a sudden he got the, you know, he's got the dreads. He's yeah. ready to let's keep peace, guys. But so we'll see if Drake's going to stand down. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know where's it go from here. But hopefully, the music becomes better. I hope that's the case. Yes, uh, I wanted to stay in that um, in that fun competitive. They don't even have to like each other. But that you're have you wake up in the morning and you're looking to compete with something. And it's, yeah, I wake up and I want that smoke. I want to fight with people. I want to drop some bombs and progress everything. And that guy is in the way. So 
I'm all for that. But I heard someone today who brought it up to me. It was like, hey, man, this rap battle is great, man. This might be bigger than Biggie and Tupac. I love that. And this person went down some world star hip hop route. And I'm like, no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not what we want. Don't, out do, of that. This. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's like, what the, hell's, what the hell's wrong with you? Just uh, shut up. And he was like, no, nah, man, this is going to be great. And we're going to, I'm like, I got to just, just stop with the, the world star angle, man. Get out of here with that. Why don't you go watch some, why don't you go watch some fake internet ready hologram tour instead of dealing with the rat beasts like these kids are doing now. And uh, yeah, I'm talking about Hatsune Miku. The, her concert is doing big and sell, her tour is selling out at $225 a pop. Basically, this is in a computer generated avatar. And I assume they're adding AI into the mix with how well her presentations go and how well her concerts are. But yeah, this character, Hatsune Miku, came out a, a, quite a while ago and they've just continually made her more and more of a brand and she doesn't even exist. And people are paying $225 to go see a hologram concert. Theo, does this alarm you? Yeah, it did shock me, Mr. Benja. I was <laughs> in downtown Orlando this past week. I live in Tampa. It's about an hour and a half away. And I was just staying in the hotel. And uh, yeah, these girls are coming up with the pink hair, just hanging out. And I was like, okay, it's a comic. I, I get it. Cosplay. Look, I'm one of the sure. people. I'm like, oh, it's a comic con corner. I was like, oh, okay, it's about I, people. I, How I'm am I down. doing? I'm down. <laughs> hey, kids, I'm down. <laughs> they said, no, son, this is a hard. <laughs> yeah, this is a whole, this is a hologram concert. This is like with. And they were just like, you could tell they were just in love. You talking about, was it in trust? They were just like fans. They were like, this is who I rock with. And it was like the girl I talked to, she said, she almost was like apologetic when she said the, the artist's name, Atsumi Miku, but she was also like, do you like her too? <laughs> and I was like, Atsumi Miku? <laughs> I was like, no. But I was just like, man, people are paying that much money and probably traveling. They were staying in the hotel just to go see this, this concert, man. It's not like a real person. So it's like, man, we are blurring the lines more and more. The pop artists become more, let's be honest, generated by AI and marketing with their lyrics and the marketing messaging. Yeah. And then we're creating virtual images. You heard about that holographic Tupac out there, right? Yeah. I think this is probably where it's going to go. And I. We talked about this for the first billion. Mr. Beast will be replaced. I hope he's working on this on his own, but he will, will be replaced by an influencer that is AI generated. That's just my prediction. Because think about it. They, they can do way more than he can do consistently mm -hmm. all the time. I'm surprised that YouTube's in there is not working on it, on it themselves. Why not? Uh, yeah, definitely, man. I'm, you've got to assume that they've got the R&D and someone's doing it in some office, some lab some office complex somewhere, but yeah, they they don't have anything on the docket to be released, but I can guarantee they're in there trying this stuff out. And, and Cause if they can create their own AI generated influencer that keeps people on the platform longer and longer so they can make more money ads, why pay ad revenue to these people anymore? Yeah. <laughs> so that's exactly. the vision. Because they're getting a lot of revenue to Mr. Beast. But to be fair, he's getting people's eyeballs. And to Mr. Beast's credit, which all creators are starting to do, that have influence and followers, they're creating offline events or they're creating products, physical products they can sell to people. Because they know there's only a matter of time where that spigot from, the, from, from these platforms will be turned off, yeah. in my opinion. Exactly. And it's not just a thing that businesses are using to try to get new users. Hey, this is a cute little toy or whatever. All these ideas that we've talked about have started to become part of the real world, the world that we access all the time. I just sent you a little story from the guardian. I forgot that this actually came up, but basically Ukraine has unveiled a, an AI generated foreign ministry spokesperson. What? Yes. So they've got a foreign ministry spokesperson that is an AI generated person. It's this, this young lady who I'm trying to describe what this bot is, but basically it's a young lady who is AI generated and she's a spokesperson. So I guess if you go to the website and ask questions like, Hey, how do I find 
how do I find the nearest taco stand in the Ukraine? And I suppose this AI generated spokesperson will say something. Maybe they want this to be their press minister, ministry of press or whatever. And this lady, this AI generated person can just read from all of the documents that they've got in the Ukraine and tell you what's going on. I don't know, but basically it, this person has a name too. I called it a person. I called the AI a person. <laughs> yeah. Victoria, she, I think that's yeah. what they call her. Yeah. Wow. Mr. Benja. Yeah. It's look, I saw this uh, movie one time. It said, Hey, I didn't think I would be in the future, but here we are. So it's, it's the, and this stuff moves pretty fast. People don't yeah. realize how fast it's going to go. And so it's the beginning seeds by 2025, we might see way more in virtual influencers out there when the technology gets better and better. So yeah, so I think music is out there, Korean making AI images. One thing, you know, AI, since we're talking about AI, I did want to bring this out and put this in the show notes, but I was listening to this article or listened to this podcast recently. And they talked about, hey, when people are thinking about AI, one of the things that's interesting is the data sets. They're saying performance of how employees working or how baseball players performing, that data set has become more and more important. And so like a data set based on performance, it may be more private. So let's say you employer or employee, you may not want your employer to have access to your performance because then they can determine how much they pay you. An example they yep. gave was like uh, baseball players, right? They have, they know exactly based on biometrics and based on your swing power, how to get more swing efficiency out of you just by looking at video images and making predictive analysis. But the baseball players don't want to give that to the owners because they know they're going to use that to their advantage and be like, okay, let me take your data set and I'll just create my own. Based on your data, I'll find a similar player like you and teach them how to do what you're doing. So that the players in their contracts actually say, I don't want my performance data to get access to the owner, right? Or to my manager. So I keep my own performance data. So I know how to get myself better, but I, that data is not leaking out to anyone else. And the other example was lawyers as well, right? Can lawyers look at data sets of, of actions that won cases that they try? Basically, yeah. there's tons of court records. So now they emulate that and win more cases, but they don't want people to realize like how they got, how they improved, what did they do differently? Yeah. How did they script stuff? They or want to even, keep it internal. Yeah. Or even if knowing how a certain judge thinks, here's yeah. how this judge ruled on this judge was his background in X, Y, and Z. So yeah. based on all that information, I could basically game the system and work the judge a certain way with all this data I have. Yeah. So I perceive where people, we talked about this before with like Google have access mm -hmm. to your data. I think a lot of folks are realizing any type of metrics that you have, how do you keep it internal to yourself? And there's that, that the closed system from open AI, Facebook has their open AI system. So I'm curious to see how AI is going to evolve when people are going to be like, you know what? I need to have ownership of my own data and my own algorithm because I just don't trust these guys anymore. I think social media has proven that it's not trustworthy. And that's going to be interesting to see how it all pays, plays out in the next couple of years. Yeah. Do you think AI should be used to create comic books? Sure. If it's good. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was about to say, I don't mind AI. Like an AI judge, I would actually like, yeah, okay. The AI judge said that. Actually, that's yeah. a bad statement. I do mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but for a lot of stuff, it's like, all right, whatever. Just throw the AI at it. But yeah, uh, another story. This AI, a guy online basically called out a comic artist, Andrea Sorrentino. If you search Andrea Sorrentino Twitter, you'll find all kinds of information. But they used AI to create a comic book and allegedly, I'm looking at this and saying, no, this is AI mm. being used to help make this comic, not just tools like Photoshop and generative fills and things like that, but it's a little interesting just the way this comic book came together. So I don't know. Did you have a chance to look at the, the evidence, the pictures? What'd you think? I did. Sean Case. You always got to look at the fingers, at least now yeah. it's going to get better, but. When the fingers are looking deformed and then they obviously are creating a look for a joker that we've never seen before. They can wear skinny jeans. 
yeah. and eight pack abs. It's, this may have been modeled off of something. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I can guarantee that AI is being used in comic books in general as a tool to help out certain things. Because what you can do is take certain images or maybe loose sketches and have the AI generate data or imagery around that. I see that, I could see that happening. And with these comic book artists on such a schedule that they're on, they have to release stuff fast. And stories come in, art comes in, it's like everything has to be done quickly. So I could see them being very, I don't want to say open, but they could get a lot of leverage off of using AI. But of course, it's that type of industry where once you get hit with the AI taboo, the AI mark on you, it's like, you got that stink on you forever. It's like, hey, aren't you the guy mm. that did Batman with AI? Get the hell out of my office. They'll come <laughs> throw confetti and peanut butter on you at a, at okay. Comic-Con. That's like the new version of Tar and Feather, by the way. Confetti and peanut butter. Oh, did not know that. But you mentioned also in the notes that people are putting little funky emojis across all their content, right? On um, social mm -hmm. medias. But it does feel like a little bit about trying to quell the dam. You're trying to put your hand against the door and the, the rushing yeah. floods are coming in and you say, no, the AI is stuck. She's not coming in AI. But I don't know what, if that's useful for the art community, man. It's, it, what use is that? Is they have to figure a way to make peace with it because it's just going to, AI will always beat you in qu quantity, right? And so yeah. it's just a matter, and it's going to get better and better over time, which is almost going to be indistinguishable. So I think uh, artists, and I get it, it's their livelihood and this is what you spend hours a day to obsess over or color grading and all this stuff that you do. But I don't know, as an artist, Mr. Benja, how do you not feel threatened? And what should you do so you don't feel like you're just a bed, you know, something that's inevitable that's coming your way anyway? Whenever change comes, you have to change something. Something has to change. Whether everybody can say, no, we don't like that. Like the words in a rat beef, there's like, everyone says, no, we don't do this. Then you can have that kind of walled off area. But it seems like there are too many cracks in the wall already. Get with the times, find a happy medium, do something that doesn't destroy the art prop form itself. That's the biggest concern of mine. So keep the art alive and don't be stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Mr. Ben, just trying to look at, I think I want before we end here, unless there was anything else you wanted to cover, I did want to talk a little bit about the hot take I got. I want to get your hot, hot take for you. You Let's got hot. You ready for it? Let's drop this hot take. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Benjo, mm -hmm. if there is no compelling reason to watch your movie or big social media movement, your movie will die. Why are we watching movies like the fall guy that's coming out this weekend? We have no big MCU movie where we will go see it because number one, it's MCU known quantity, but number two, there was a story that we've been following for decades, almost in this case, to figure out what was going to be next or what happened in the past or these characters that we love. Well, if you have IP that is something from a move, a TV show that came out in the 70s, why are we watching that movie, Mr. Benja? Or bigger, better yet, if you don't have a big social media movement like Barbie Hammer that gets people excited, to want to go see it, making it an event, then how would you, why would you go see the movies anymore, Mr. Benja? And I, I say that as someone who contemplated to go see this new movie that came out. I'm a movie guy. I like to see movies. I just couldn't do it. I was like, fall guy? Oh, looks good. Uh, I, I, I can't do it. So, Mr. Benja, are, the movies may be dead, and I just want to let people know that now because if there's n the only movie I'm super excited about this summer is Deadpool v. Wolverine. Everything else is barbecue for kindling for my next rant. So there you go, Mr. Benja. <laughs> I got nothing for you. <laughs> I These love movies it. suck. All right, guys. So I hope you enjoyed it. Definitely go like, subscribe, comment on Show vs. Business on Twitter or X, YouTube, Instagram. Listen to us on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you listen to podcasts. Go visit us on our website, show versus business. 
Go check it out. Also, if you have ideas on, if you want to start your own podcast, we want to put some stuff out there to help you as well. Mr. Benja, have a good one. Peace.